My name is uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU. I got to speak up loud. This is just for looks, actually. Next is for actually we're taping the, the proceeding, but it, 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 it doesn't amplify in the room. Uh, and uh, I'm the director of the Foley Institute here at WSU, and I want to welcome you out to uh, uh, our the first of this year's distinguished lectures that we have, and it will be given by Stephen Levitsky from Harvard University. But before I introduce our speaker and tonight's subject, uh, I just have a couple of announcements. If you're here for the common reading program or for a class, there'll be uh, s somebody out uh, to swipe or to, uh, to you can sign in. Uh, after the event, it won't, won't be, they won't be there until six o'clock at the end of the event, so don't go out earlier. Uh, also, uh, those of you who want to hear more from Dr. Levitsky, and I'm sure most of you will after you hear tonight's presentation, he, he will be giving a second presentation tomorrow at noon at the Foley Institute. There he'll be talking about uh, populism in Latin America. So I encourage you to come to that as well. Finally, I just want to thank the College of Arts and Sciences for their continued support of the Foley Institute. For those of you who don't know much about the Foley Institute, we were established back in 1995 here at WSU to honor the service of Thomas S. Foley who of course was a representative here in the 5th Congressional District for over 30 years. He uh, left Congress as the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, the uh, highest uh, serving official in the history of the state of Washington, and then later went on to serve as the ambassador, uh, U.S. Ambassador to Japan. The institute that bears Mr. Foley's name continues his legacy of leadership and public service through a variety of programs that aim at educating the public about democratic institutions, and trying to encourage young people to pursue careers in public service. We do a lot of really interesting things at the Foley Institute. If you want to know more about us and our programs, I encourage you to uh, like us on Facebook, go to our website, even send us an email, and we'll send you information about our upcoming programs. The Foley Distinguished Lecture Series recognizes Mr. Foley's belief that the critical challenges that confront us in the 21st century can only be met through innovative thinking and informed civil dialogue. Some of our previous distinguished lecturers have included such luminaries as the former governor of Vermont and DNC chair Howard Dean, New York Times journalist Nicholas Kristof, United States Attorney General John Ashcroft, NAACP President Kwasi Mfume, as well as political scholars such as Mo Fiorina from Stanford and Theta Scotchpole from Harvard as well as accomplished writers and commentators like Christopher Hitchens and Chris Hedges. Tonight's distinguished lecture comes at a critical time in American democracy and indeed for democracies around the world. While dictators today rarely come to power through military coups or violent revolutions like they did in the past, elected gov uh, democratic breakdowns have, uh, excuse me, democracies nevertheless are imperiled around the globe. During the past 50 years, democratic breakdowns have been caused not by generals or revolutionaries, but by elected governments. From Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, to Viktor Orban in Hungary, to Recep Erdogan in Turkey, to Sisi in e Egypt, or Vladimir Putin in Russia, the road to authoritarianism today begins at the ballot box. There are no tanks in the streets, constitutions aren't sus suspended, Elections still take place, but elected autocrats eviscerate the substance of democracy while maintaining its veneer. They pack courts, bully the free press, corrupt law enforcement and other government institutions, and they de delegitimize political opponents and opposition parties. How vulnerable is the United States to this form of democratic breakdown? And does Donald Trump pose just such a threat? If so, what can be done? Fortunately, we have someone eminently qualified to discuss these issues with us tonight. Stephen Levitsky is a professor of government at Harvard University and the chair of Harvard's Weatherhead Research Cluster on Challenges to Democracy. His research interests include political parties, authoritarianism and democratization, populism, and weak or informal institutions with a focus on Latin America and the United States. He is the author of many books and articles. His recent book, written with Daniel Ziblatt, how Democracies Die was an international bestseller and the winner of the Goldsmith Book Prize for Improving Democratic Governance. That book will form the basis of tonight's lecture. Please join me now in giving a warm cougar welcome to Stephen Levitsky.
Thanks. Can you hear me? You know what? I think I need my I think I need my glasses. Hold on a second. This way I look a little more distinguished. So many thanks to Professor Clayton and uh, to Richard and the Foley Institute for, for the invitation. Um, this is my first time to to Wazoo. Can I say Wazoo? Is it is it Wazoo or is it W S U? Because I've gotten conflicting. But which one is better? W S U. See, I'm getting conflicting. All right. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've never been here before, and uh, and and I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I want to talk today, as Professor Clayton mentioned, about the potential dangers facing American democracy. Now, anyone who's taken a political science course, according to really basic social science, I should not be giving this talk. Political scientists don't know much, but we've uncovered two pretty solid facts. First of all, rich democracies never die. And secondly, old democracies never die. In fact, no democracy even remotely as rich or as old as America's has ever broken, broken down. An, an analysis by UCLA political scientist Daniel Treisman found that based on its age and its wealth, the United States is 35 times less likely to suffer a democratic breakdown than Germany was in the 1930s. It is 134 times less likely to suffer a democratic breakdown than Chile in 1972. So statistically speaking, anyway, US democracy seems pretty safe. But I want to suggest that there are at least three reasons to think we may have entered uncharted territory. First of all, levels of income inequality today in the United States are higher than any time since before the Great Depression. Secondly, the United States has begun a transition that, to my knowledge, no democracy has ever successfully undergone. That's an, a transition in which a previously dominant ethnic group loses its majority status. I will return to that point. And third, Americans have elected a president with visibly authoritarian instincts. None of that means that American democracy is dead. None of that means that American democracy is dying. But we do think it's cause for concern. Now, democracies don't die the way they used to die. Democracies used to die at the hands of men with guns. During the Cold War, during most of the 20th century, three out of every four democratic breakdowns took the form of a military coup, generals seizing power. But as Professor Clayton noted, today democracies die in a much more subtle way. They die at the hands not of generals, but of elected leaders, elected presidents, elected prime ministers, who use the very institutions of democracy to subvert it. They use elections and plebiscites. They use acts of parliament or Congress. They use Supreme Court rulings. This is Putin, it's Chavez, it's Erdogan, Viktor Orban in Hungary. What is so dangerous about this electoral road to autocracy is that it happens behind a pretty credible facade of democracy. Again, there are no tanks in the streets. The Constitution usually remains intact. There are still elections. Congress continues to operate. And as a result, many citizens are not aware of what's happening until it's too late. In 2011, 12 years into Hugo Chavez's presidency in Venezuela, surveys showed that a solid majority of Venezuelans still believed that they were living under a democracy. So if democratic breakdown today begins at the ballot box, one of the keys to protecting democracy lies in keeping authoritarians from getting elected in the first place. Pretty basic. Here, political parties play a crucial role. Parties are democracy's gatekeepers. Elected authoritarians very rarely come to power on their own. They almost always get a hand from at least one of the country's mainstream political parties. One of the parties calculates that working with the extremist can help it politically in the short term, can help it win an election, can help it defeat some hated rival. So in Italy in the early 1920s, liberal leader Giovanni Gioletti, hoping to tap into Mussolini's mass appeal, brought the fascists on to his party's parliamentary list uh, for election. That did not end well. German conservatives in the late 1920s forged a working alliance with the Nazis, trying to draw on Hitler's grassroots appeal to shore up their party's declining base. In both of those parties, in both those cases, mainstream parties, liberals in Italy, conservatives in Germany, abandoned their gatekeeping role and let extremists in the door. 
In both cases, it turned out to be, obviously, a tragic miscalculation. Now, historically, American parties have been excellent gatekeepers. The United States has had no shortage of extremist demagogues. Father Coughlin, Henry Ford, Huey Long, jo uh, Joe McCarthy, George Wallace. Surveys show that each of the figures that I just mentioned at some point enjoyed 30, 35% public approval, at least, uh, which is not far from where President Trump started out. None of those figures made it anywhere near the presidency. All of them, in, for different reasons, different ways, were kept out by the parties, and in particular by the party's candidate selection process. Prior to 1972, presidential candidates were selected by party leaders, by party bosses, in party conventions, in what we now think of as smoke-filled back rooms. That old system, the old convention system, was not very open, it was not very transparent, it was not very democratic, but it was a pretty effective gatekeeping mechanism. Party leaders knew the, 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 the potential candidates because they had worked with them, often for years. They knew their strengths, they knew their weaknesses, they knew which ones were fit for office, they knew which ones were demigods. And in fact, for all of its shortcomings, and the old system had a lot of shortcomings, for all of its shortcomings, the old convention system had a perfect record in keeping demagogues out. Now, the primary system that American parties adopted starting in 1972 is much more open, it's much more transparent, it's much more democratic. But it has weakened party leaders' role as gatekeepers. And we saw this very clearly in 2016. Republican leaders, almost to a person, despised Donald Trump. They knew damn well that he was unfit for office. But under the primary system, they had no tools to stop him. So primaries are double-edged. They're more democratic, but they also leave us more vulnerable to demagogues. Had the old convention system been in place in 2016, Donald Trump would not have come anywhere near the White House. Now, electing a demagogue does not condemn us to democratic breakdown. This is where our institutions come into play. Americans have a lot of faith in our Constitution, and for good reason. Our Constitution is the oldest, almost certainly the most successful on Earth. Our Constitution has checked many powerful, many ambitious presidents in the past, from Andrew Jackson to Teddy Roosevelt to FDR to Nixon. But constitutions by themselves are never enough to protect democracy. Even the most brilliantly designed constitutions, and we've got a pretty good one, do not function automatically. They've got to be reinforced by strong democratic norms or unwritten rules. And our book focuses on two norms in particular. Not all norms, just two. First one is what we call mutual toleration. That means accepting the legitimacy of one's partisan rivals. That means that no matter how much we may disagree with our rivals, no matter how much we may dislike our rivals, we recognize both publicly and in private that they are loyal citizens who love the country just as much as we do and who have an equal and legitimate right to exist, to compete, and if they beat us, to govern. In other words, we do not treat our rivals as enemies. Second norm is a little more complicated. It's what we call forbearance. Forbearance means refraining from exercising one's legal right. It is an act of self-restraint, deliberate self-restraint. It's an underutilization of one's power. Now, we don't often think about forbearance in politics, but it is absolutely vital. Think about what the United States president is constitutionally able to do. The president can pardon whomever she wants, whenever she wants. Any president with a majority in Congress can pack the Supreme Court. If you don't like the ideological composition or the partisan composition of the Supreme Court, you can, if you have a majority in, the, in, in Congress, expand it to 11, expand it to 13, fill it with allies. That is perfectly legal. The president can circumvent Congress and make policy through executive orders or, more recently, as we saw, by declaring a national emergency. The Constitution does not prohibit such action. Or think about what the Congress can legally, constitutionally do. Congress can shut down the government by refusing to fund it. The Senate can use its right to advice and consent 
to prevent the president from filling cabinet seats, to prevent the president from filling Supreme Court vacancies. And the House, of course, can impeach the president on any grounds it chooses. My point here is that politicians can exploit the letter of the Constitution in ways that totally eviscerate the spirit of the Constitution. Court packing, partisan impeachment, government shutdowns, national emergencies. Legal scholar Mark Tushnet calls this behavior, using the letter of the law to subvert the spirit of the law, he calls that behavior constitutional hardball. You look at any failing or failed democracy anywhere, and you'll find an abundance of exactly that, of constitutional hardball. Spain and Germany in the 1930s, Chile in the early 1970s, contemporary Poland, Hungary, Venezuela, Turkey. What prevents a democracy like ours from descending into a destructive spiral of constitutional hardball is this thing called forbearance. It is a shared commitment to institutional restraint a shared commitment to not use the letter of the law to subvert its spirit. A couple of examples. Think about presidential term limits historically in the United States. Prior to 1951, the US Constitution placed no limits on presidential reelection. Legally, American presidents could be president for life, just like uh, Hugo Chavez was. But for nearly 150 years, despite the fact that presidents could be president for life, our leaders followed a precedent set by George Washington, and nobody sought a third term. It was not the Constitution that prevented ambitious presidents like Jefferson, Jackson, and Grant from seeking a third term. It was a norm of forbearance, a norm of restraint. Or take the Senate filibuster. Filibuster is a really powerful tool. It can grind Congress to a halt. But for most of the 20th century, the filibuster was rarely used. The Senate recorded an average of fewer than one filibuster a year between 1917 and 1960. Senators exercised forbearance, restraint. These two norms of mutual toleration and forbearance serve as what Dan and I call the soft guardrails of democracy. They help to prevent healthy political competition from spiraling into the kind of partisan fight to the death that wrecked democracies in Europe in the 1930s and in South America in the 1960s and 70s. Now, the United States has not always had soft guardrails. It didn't have them in the 1790s when partisan warfare between the uh, Federalists and the Republicans nearly destroyed the Republic before it could take hold. America's guardrails clearly collapsed in the run-up to the Civil War, and actually they remained very weak all the way through Reconstruction. The 1860s and 1870s were replete with constitutional hardball. Changes to the size of the Supreme Court in 1866 and 1869, an, a, a partisan impeachment in 1868, a contested and probably stolen election in 1876. Norms of mutual toleration and forbearance really only took hold in this country in the late 19th century. And it's worth taking just a second to think about why they took hold. Mutual toleration was reestablished only after the Republican Party abandoned Reconstruction and allowed Democrats to establish Jim Crow in the South. Southern Democrats, after the Civil War, viewed Reconstruction and viewed black suffrage as an existential threat, and they fought like hell against it. That, that is what polarized our politics in the 1870s. It was only after the Republicans essentially gave in and abandon Reconstruction, in effect, abandoning the goal of racial equality, that the two parties began to peacefully coexist. So the norms of mutual toleration and forbearance that undergirded our 20th century democracy emerged out of a profoundly undemocratic arrangement, the political exclusion for nearly a century of African Americans in the South. With that important caveat in mind, Norms of mutual toleration and forbearance were pretty strong in the United States for much of the 20th century. Democrats and Republicans accepted one another as legitimate rivals, and with rare exceptions, they avoided destabilizing acts of constitutional hardball. There were no impeachments, there, uh, there were no court packings, there were no costly government shutdowns. Supreme Court nominees were, were approved even when the opposition party controlled the Senate. And outside of wartime, there's a fair amount of wartime, but outside of wartime, presidents refrained from circumventing Congress 
through things like executive orders or national emergencies. So for more than a century, from the late 19th century to the late 20th century, our system of checks and balances, our constitutional system of checks and balances worked pretty well. But again, the system worked pretty well because it was reinforced by norms of mutual toleration and forbearance. Now we argue that America's democratic norms have been unraveling over the last quarter century. There were signs of this, early signs of it in the 1990s. Newt Gingrich, who became House Speaker in 1995, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, instructed his Republican allies to use, or suggested to his Republican allies, that they use terms like betray, anti-flag, and traitor to describe Democrats. In other words, he encouraged fellow Republicans to abandon the discourse of mutual toleration. Gingrich was also a master, an early master, of constitutional hardball. He engineered the first major government shutdown in the modern era in 1995, and three years later, his allies in the House impeached Bill Clinton on a technicality. That was the first impeachment in 130 years. Now, the erosion of mutual toleration really accelerated, though, during the Obama presidency. Republican leaders like Gingrich, Palin, Giuliani, Huckabee, Trump, began to tell their followers in private and in public that President Obama didn't love America, that Obama and the Democrats were not real Americans, and that maybe President Obama wasn't even an American citizen. Let's give you one example. Colorado Congressman Mike Kaufman declared in a fundraiser, I quote, I do not know if Barack Obama was born in the United States of America, but I do know this, that in his heart, he's not an American. He's just not an American. Now, America's always had an extremist fringe, but this was no longer fringe politics. These were national Republican leaders. This was the party's 2016 presidential candidate. Leading Republicans, leading national Republicans, were beginning to deny the legitimacy of their Democratic rivals. That worries us, because when mutual toleration disappears, politicians start to abandon forbearance. When we view our partisan rivals not as rivals, but as enemies. When we view our partisan rivals as an existential threat, we grow tempted to use any means necessary, any tool in the toolbox, to beat them. And that is exactly what has begun to happen over the last decade. After the 2010 Tea Party election, the Republican Congress treated the Obama administration as an existential threat that had to be defeated at any cost. There were more filibusters during Obama's second term than in all the years between World War I and Reagan's second term combined. And it was not just trivial stuff they were filibustering. Congress twice shut down the government, and at one point it pushed the United States to the brink of default. President Obama responded with constitutional hardball of his own. When Congress refused to pass immigration reform or climate change legislation, he circumvented Congress and made policy via executive orders. That action was technically legal, but it clearly violated the spirit of the Constitution. But the most stunning act of constitutional hardball during the Obama years was the Senate's decision in 2016 not to allow President Obama to fill the Supreme Court vacancy created by Justice Antonin Scalia's death. That move, not allowing the president to fill a Supreme Court vacancy, was unprecedented since 1866. All this stuff I just mentioned happened before Donald Trump was elected president. So the problem is not just that Americans elected a demagogue in 2016. It's that we elected a demagogue at a time when the soft guardrails protecting our democracy were becoming unmoored. So why is this happening? We argue that what is driving norm uh, erosion is ultimately polarization. Over the last 25 or 30 years, Republicans and Democrats have come to fear and loathe one another. In 1960, there's a famous uh, survey, I'm not sure how good a survey, but a famous survey that found that 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said they would be displeased if their kid married someone from the other party. 5%. Today, that number is nearly 50%. According to a Pew survey from last year, 49% of Republicans and 55% of Democrats say the other party makes them afraid. A recent study by Liliana Mason and some colleagues found 
that 60% of Democrats and Republicans believe that the other party is a danger to the United States. We have not seen this level of partisan hatred since Reconstruction. And this is not just traditional liberal conservative polarization. People do not fear and loathe one another in this way over taxes or health care. They just don't. Today's partisan differences run deeper. They are about racial and cultural identity. Our partisan identities have changed dramatically over my lifetime, over the last 50 years. Back in the 1960s and the 1970s, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party had different platforms, but were culturally and demographically very similar. Both parties were overwhelmingly white and Christian. Three changes have occurred over the last half century. First of all, the Civil Rights Movement led to a massive migration of Southern whites from the Democrats to the Republicans, while African Americans, in some cases for the first time enfranchised, became overwhelmingly Democrats. Second, the United States experienced a massive wave of immigration. Most of those, immigra the, most of those immigrants and their kids ended up in the Democratic Party. And third, since Reagan, evangelical Christians have flocked overwhelmingly to the Republican Party. Back in the late 1970s, evangelicals were split between the two parties. Now they're overwhelmingly Republican. So today, the Democrats and Republicans represent very, very different communities. The Democrats are a weird rainbow coalition of urban educated whites and a range of ethnic minorities. Nearly half of the Democratic Party vote is non-white today. The Republicans, by contrast, remain overwhelmingly white and Christian. So what? This is important because white Christians are not just any group in the society. Not only were they once an overwhelming electoral majority, but they occupied the top rung on every single one of our country's social, economic, political, and cultural hierarchies. They filled the presidency, they filled the Senate, the Supreme Court, they filled all the governor's mansions, they were the CEOs, they were the TV newscasters, they were college professors, they were the pillars of local communities, they were the face of both the Democratic and Republican Party. Those days are long gone, obviously. But losing a majority, and more than that, losing one's dominant social status can be deeply threatening. Many Republican voters, not all, many Republican voters feel like the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. And for many, that feels like an existential threat. That, we argue, is what fuels the, the radicalization of the Republican Party and what ultimately drives polarization in the United States. The problem is that polarization can kill democracy. Research by Milan Sfolik, a political scientist at Yale, shows that the more polarized a society is, the more we become willing to tolerate undemocratic behavior by our own side, as long as it's against the other guys. Let me give you one example, a recent one. A survey from last week found that just about half of Republicans now think it's OK for the President of the United States to solicit help from foreign governments to dig up dirt on his rival in the next presidential election. When politics is so polarized that we come to view a victory by our rivals as something that's catastrophic, as something that's intolerable, we start to justify using extraordinary means to prevent that from happening. Things like violence, election fraud, coups. Americans haven't quite reached that point. But we have reached a point where according to exit polls in 2016, one out of four Donald Trump voters, one out of four people who pulled the lever for Donald Trump said that they believed he was unfit for office, and yet they still preferred him to the Democrat. We've reached a point where, according to Gallup polls since 2017, Republicans have a much more favorable view of Vladimir Putin than of Hillary Clinton. That's a dangerous level of polarization. Donald Trump is a symptom of that polarization. He's not a cause of it, and his departure, whenever that is, will not put an end to it. All right, so what's happened in the two years since we wrote How Democracies Die? I'd say we've had both good news and not so good news. The good news is that America's democratic antibodies are pretty strong. President Trump turned out to be every bit as authoritarian as advertised. He tried to purge and pack our law enforcement agencies and to use them to investigate 
and punish his rivals. This is what Daniel and I call uh, capturing the referees in our book. Trump has flouted uh, congressional authorities, flouted the rule of law. He accuses his critics of treason and tries to investigate them. And he has, on multiple occasions now, tried to use the power of the presidency to induce foreign governments to investigate his political rivals, openly soliciting foreign intervention in American elections. This is unmistakably the behavior of an autocrat. But Trump has faced serious pushback. He's faced pushback from the media, from the courts, from law enforcement agencies, from civil society, and maybe most importantly of all, from voters. Last year's midterm election were a, was a clear reminder that the United States is not like Russia, Hungary, or Venezuela. Those are countries where authoritarian governments steamrolled weak opposition. The United States has a strong opposition. That opposition now controls the House, and that House is now very likely to impeach Trump. Now, the not so good news is that the underlying problems of polarization and norm erosion have not gone away. They persist. Our system of checks and balances only works, only functions when there exists a minimum of mutual toleration and forbearance. Without forbearance, divided government can very, very easily descend into institutional warfare in which checks and balances essentially become weaponized. This is a world of stolen Supreme Court seats, of partisan impeachments, of government shutdowns, of declarations of national emergency. That's the principal danger that we face today. American democracy is not so much sliding into, into authoritarianism as it is into utter dysfunction. We've had nine months of, is that right? Nine months of divided government during the Trump presidency? Nine short months. During those nine months, we've, had, uh, we've experienced the longest government shutdown in the history of the republic. We've experienced a fabricated national emergency aimed at defying the will of Congress, the launching of an impeachment inquiry, and the administration's refusal to cooperate with that impeachment inquiry. Last year, Daniel and I had a, a meeting with a group of senators, and one senator, who's actually running for president, um, this is about half the Senate, told us <laughs> that, and he's, this guy's a pretty serious guy, pretty moderate, um, said that he's pretty sure we will never again see a successful Supreme Court nomination when the President's party does not control the Senate. In other words, Merrick Garland is about to become not the exception, but the norm. That's a dangerous and debilitating level of dysfunction. Let me add one more layer of dysfunction that's also caused by our partisan polarization. Many of our country's most important democratic institutions are biased towards sparsely populated territories. They give your neighbors in Idaho a huge political advantage over the folks in my home state in New York or down there in California. The Electoral College and the Senate are both biased towards sparsely populated territories. And because the Senate su uh, approves Supreme Court nominees, the Supreme Court is also indirectly biased towards sparsely populated territories. Now, that wasn't a huge problem for about 200 years of our history. I mean, it kind of sucked for the state of New York, but it didn't have a partisan effect for the first two centuries of our republic because neither party uh, was overwhelmingly urban or rural. Both parties had urban wings and rural wings. So it favored Wyoming and it, and it screwed New York, but it didn't favor one party over the other. That has now changed because today, our parties are split along urban and rural lines. Today, the Democrats are overwhelmingly based in big metropolitan uh, centers, which turn states blue. And the Republicans are overwhelmingly based in sparsely populated territories, which are the bases of red states. That means that Republicans have a leg up in the Electoral College, in the Senate, and, uh, and in the Supreme Court. And as a result, we're seeing a growing gap between election results on the one hand and the actual distribution of political power in the other. Two of our last three presidents came to office having lost the popular vote. The Democrats overwhelmingly won the overall popular vote in the Senate in 2016 and in 2018, and yet Republicans control the Senate. The growing gap between who wins the most votes and who holds power 
could seriously erode the legitimacy of our constitutional system, particularly among younger urban Americans. So what can be done? What the hell can we do? Most importantly, the Republican Party has to change. It has to become a more diverse political party. As long as the Republicans remain an overwhelmingly white Christian party in a society as diverse as ours in 2019, they will be prone to extremism. Let me develop this point a minute because I think it's important. Democracy requires that parties know how to lose. That means that when we lose an election, we go home, get drunk, regroup, come back ready to play again the next day. But for parties to do that, for parties to lose graciously, for parties to accept defeat, two conditions have to hold. First of all, parties have to believe that they stand a chance of winning elections sometime in the future. And secondly, parties have to believe that losing will not bring ruinous consequences. When politicians fear that they're not going to be able to win future elections, or that, that defeat today will bring catastrophe, the stakes rise dramatically. Politicians' time horizon is narrow. They throw tomorrow to the wind, and they use any means necessary to win today. In other words, desperation, fear of losing, leads politicians to play dirty. My co-author, Daniel, who's the smart one, I'm sorry, um, found this dynamic in his research on 19th century Germany. German conservatives in the, in the latter part of the 19th century were terrified by the prospect of universal suffrage, giving the working class the right to vote. For them, giving the working class the right to vote meant not only conservatives' electoral demise, but the demise of the entire aristocratic order. So conservatives played dirty. They used fraud and repression to hold on to power all the way through World War I. Or think about Southern Democrats after the Civil War. Reconstruction in the 15th Amendment brought widespread black enfranchisement throughout the South. African Americans constituted a majority or a near majority in most Southern states. I think six out of 11 states. So their enfranchisement scared the bejesus out of Southern Democrats and their constituencies. Not only did black suffrage threaten Democrats' electoral uh, dominance, but it threatened, potentially, to overturn the entire racial order. Facing what they believed to be an existential threat, the Democrats played dirty. Between 1885 and 1908, all 11 post-Confederate states passed laws that used poll taxes, literacy tests, and property and residency requirements to effectively eliminate African Americans' right to vote. Black turnout in the South fell from 61% in 1880 to 2% in 1912. Unwilling to lose, Democrats stripped the right to vote from nearly half the population, ushering in about 80 years of authoritarian rule in the South. We fear that something similar is happening to the Republican Party today. The Republicans' medium-term electoral prospects are not great. The Republicans, again, are an overwhelmingly white Christian party, but white Christians are a declining share of the American electorate. In 1992, when Bill Clinton was elected, white Christians were 72% of the electorate. By 2012, Obama's re-election, white Christians were down to 57% of the electorate. By 2024, they'll be less than 50%. But that's only part of it. It's much worse than that, because younger voters are overwhelmingly Democratic. In the midterms last year, people aged 18 to 29 voted Democrat by a more than 2 to 1 margin. 30-somethings voted almost 60% Democrat. But the problem is not just that Republicans face a bleak electoral future. It's that the Republican base has come to view defeat as catastrophic. As I mentioned earlier, many Republican voters fear that they're on the brink not just of losing elections, but of losing their country. The very idea of a white Christian America seems to be slipping away. Slogans like, take our country back, make America great again, reflect, I think, that sense of peril. 
So like the old Southern Democrats, Republicans have begun to play dirty. In state after state after state, Republican governments, Republican legislatures are taking steps that make it harder for lower income and minority voters to register and to vote. They're closing polling places in predominantly African American neighborhoods. They are purging voter rolls. They're making it harder to register. Since 2010, more than a dozen states, every one of them Republican led, have adopted strict voter ID laws aimed at dampening turnout among poor and non-white voters. Georgia Republicans used um, voter suppression tactics to win last year's gubernatorial race. Texas Republicans early this year tried to purge the voter rolls of 100,000, nearly 100,000 Latinos. In North Carolina, after the Democrats won the governorship in 2016, the Republican legislature at the last minute passed a series of laws to pack state institutions and to weaken the incoming governor, including stealing two, two seats on the state court of appeals. Wisconsin Republicans followed a pretty similar playbook after Scott uh, Walker lost the governorship last year. So it's not just Trump. Republicans across the country are beginning to play dirty. The only way out of this mess is for Republicans to become a more diverse party. Once the Republicans learn how to compete for urban, secular, non-white voters, they will become more confident about winning elections and less fearful of a multiracial America. When that happens, the Republican Party should eventually de-radicalize and our politics should depolarize. Question is, what should Democrats do in the meantime? An idea that's gained a lot of traction in progressive circles recently is that Democrats need to start playing dirty. They need to learn how to fight like Republicans. The argument goes something like this. If Republicans are going to continue to play constitutional hardball, Democrats have to play tit for tat. If they don't, they'll be the victim of an endless series of sucker punches. Using forbearance, using restraint, while the other guys playing constitutional hardball is like entering a boxing ring with a hand tied behind your back. So Democrats, the argument goes, have to use all the tools in the toolbox. They have to use government shutdowns, partisan impeachments, push through statehood, statehood for Puerto Rico and DC. There's even a movement to pack the Supreme Court the next time Democrats control the presidency and the Senate. We think this would be a terrible mistake. A tit-for-tat strategy would in inevitably lead to escalation, which would accelerate the politicization of our institutions and the erosion of our democratic norms. Once the spiral of escalating constitutional hardball begins, it becomes very, very difficult to reverse, to get off the train. And if you look at other cases, from Spain in the 1930s, to Chile in the 1970s, to Turkey and Venezuela in the early 21st century, that sort of escalation rarely ends well. It almost always ends badly. Democrats should keep in mind that their medium-term electoral prospects are pretty good. Their electorate is younger, their electorate is growing. The single greatest threat to Democrats' medium-term political prospects is an escalating conflict that puts our institutions at risk, one that either destroys our democracy or that leaves it utterly dysfunctional. If Democrats start to fight like Republicans, they will be hurling themselves down that very path. So the final question is, would impeaching Donald Trump be an act of constitutional hardball? Well, if impeachment had occurred right at the time of Trump's inauguration, like Maxine Waters called for, that certainly would have been constitutional hardball. If impeachment had happened when the Democrats uh, first took over the House in January, before the Mueller investigation was, was uh, completed, I think that arguably would have been constitutional hardball. But the norm surrounding impeachment is not that, there should, that impeachment should never happen. The norm is not that we should never break the glass under any circumstances. The norm is that impeachment should be really rare. It should be deployed with great caution, with de deliberation, with restraint. It should be a last resort. It should be option Z, not option A. And if at all possible, it should be backed by a bipartisan coalition. <laughs>
The Democratic leadership, Pelosi, Schumer, et al., have been pretty restrained thus far in their, in their approach to impeachment. And I think um, had it not been for Ukraine, they would not have moved forward. They were pretending, but I think they would not have moved forward seriously with impeachment had it not been for Ukraine. But the Ukraine scandal is a game changer. First of all, it showed, I think, that the lesson that Trump took from the Russia scandal was that he had impunity. He could do whatever the hell he wanted. And secondly, crucially, the Ukraine scandal threatened the integrity of the 2020 election. Over the last year, many people have argued, and I think correctly, that it would be far better for the health of our democracy for the opposition to defeat Trump at the polls rather than through impeachment. But now we've got evidence, pretty good evidence, that Trump is trying to recruit foreign intervention into the 2020 election. He's striking at the very heart of democracy, undermining the integrity of our elections. So I think impeachment is um, the constitutionally appropriate step at this point. Um, and before the process is over, my guess is that you'll see at least some Republican support, that you will see some form of bipartisan coalition. But even if it is the appropriate step, impeachment is an incredibly unfortunate step because it will almost certainly continue and maybe even accelerate our descent into institutional warfare. So Democrats should not celebrate the impeachment process. It is a tragic, tragic thing. The United States is in the middle of an immense, immense political earthquake. We've begun again a transition that I don't think any democracy has ever successfully undergone, one in which a previously dominant ethnic group loses its majority status. I'm pretty sure we'll be the first democracy to do that. But to get there, to get to the other side, we're going to have to pass through a period of intense and polarizing reaction. That's where we are today. That's where we are at this moment. During this period of intense and polarizing reaction, we cannot afford, Americans cannot afford to be reckless with our institutions. We need to be very, very careful. We've got far too much to lose. I'll stop there. Thank you. Q&A. I'm going to ask you to keep your answers very short for a couple of reasons. One is we want to get as many in as possible, but secondly, because we're videotaping this, um, Professor, <laughs> Professor Levitsky is going to have to repeat your questions, so it's hard to remember long questions. And maybe I'll start us off. I have lots of questions I want to ask you. One is, what, what do you make of uh, Donald Trump's pronouncement today that he's not going to uh, cooperate? Yeah. What, what does he make of Donald Trump's pronouncement today that that uh, he's not going to cooperate with any of the impeachment hearings. But my, my, my more fundamental question gets at the question about polarization. You talk a lot about polarization as the cause of our current problems, and you talk about it almost entirely in cultural terms. And you didn't discuss economic polarization and the economic transformations in our society and how that might be leading to political polarization. I wonder if you see that as a problem, too. Okay, uh, look, I think that the Trump administration's announcement that it's not going to cooperate with the impeachment inquiry is totally consistent with the escalation that we've seen over the last few years. Um, at, at least in the short term, there's nothing, there's nothing that can force the government to, to cooperate. This sort of cooperation, the kind of cooperation even that we saw under, uh, with Nixon, although kicking and screaming, the sort of cooperation that we saw from Nixon required a certain amount of forbearance. It required a certain amount of, uh, of, uh, of, of restraint. Uh, if one really pushes the law to the max, one can avoid, uh, one can throw our checks and balances into utter dysfunction. So to me, the, um, the administration's response is predictable and it is, it's totally consistent with the, with, the, with the breakdown of our democratic norms. And I think it's another sign that in this context of, of polarization, uh, checks and balances become utterly dysfunctional. Our, dem our presidential democracy cannot function at this level of polarization. Now, is there an economic component to, to this polarization? There's a debate out there about whether this is mostly about race or this is mostly 
about class and, and economics. Daniel and I clearly come down on the side that it's mostly about race. Obviously, both things matter. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we now have extraordinarily high levels of income inequality. Uh, to, to push that a little further, since the mid-1970s, the um, bottom 40% of our society has not seen any improvement in their standard of living. The bottom 40% has seen its overall income basically stagnate. No, really the first time in history that a uh, younger generation does not have any expectation among the bottom 40% of, of living better than their, their parents. At the same time, the top 10% has seen its income nearly double. So, you know, people in upper middle class in Boston are doing fabulously well, and 40% of the society it has gotten nowhere in two generations. There's no question that that reinforces polarization. There's no question that feeds right-wing populism. In, in America, populism is always right-wing. Um, and there's no question that it reinforces racial resentment. But the data that I've seen, uh, uh, many, many, many Trump supporters are doing OK. Uh, it's not just the bottom 40% that supports Donald Trump. Uh, race and religion predict support for the Republican Party much, much better than class does. So uh, we, tried to, we tried to make a parsimonious argument, and we focused on what we think is most important, which is race. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, the point, the uh, more comment than a question is simply that uh, in the past, many times in the past, scientific arguments have been used basically to justify screwing over rural people. At least that's the perception of many rural folks. And so today, debates about climate change are, are being resisted by many rural residents because of this history of, of sort of misuse of, uh, of, of, of science. Uh, I, I take your point. Excellent point. Thanks. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between what you were describing and uh, I, I, I got what you were getting at, but it sounded more like a civil war to me than a, like a, anything like a rise of authoritarianism. So, what's the difference between a civil war and authoritarianism? Um, good question. I, I th there's, there are, the United States, there, the US democracy is hard to kill for a lot of reasons. One, we have very, very robust institutions. But two, we have a really strong civil society and a very strong opposition. Both political parties have a lot of money, a lot of followers, a lot of organization. To get to authoritarianism, one side has to steamroll the other side. And that's hard to do in the United States. Not impossible, but hard to do. Much harder than in Venezuela or Russia or Turkey or Hungary. Um, but extreme polarization is one path uh, maybe a prolonged path, but is one path to democratic breakdown. Many of the most uh, pro prominent democracies that have died in the last century, Spain in the 30s, Chile in the 70s, Germany in the 30s, um, Brazil in the 1960s, died as a result of extreme polarization. It will take longer in the United States, but we're seeing uh, increasing, it takes several steps. Polarization doesn't lead to a coup. It's not going to lead to a coup. But it's making our institutions utterly dysfunctional. We're not able, our Congress is not able to solve any problem. Politicians are using institutions to beat each other up rather than to solve problems. That almost certainly, if it continues, if there's a, a growing perception that our institutions are dysfunctional, that our, that, that our Congress and our president are not solving important problems, 
whether it's opioids or the environment or whatever, people are going to lose faith in democracy. And they'll become more open to the next demagogue who promises to solve their problems through some other means. That might not happen next year, might not happen in 2024, but as long as we're sunk in dysfunctionality as a result of polarization, that possibility will grow. I'm going to get a, uh, yes. Uh, so the question is, um, could, I, could I provide any more information about the, about the Ukraine scandal? I probably don't know any more than you do, um, because I'm, I'm basically following as a, as, a, as a newspaper reader at this point. But I think the, the real core facts ha in this case have been admitted by the president himself. We have a trans, what is, not a trans, a summary of a, of a phone call in which the president of the United States uh, clearly was, and there's, there's some background information that, 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 um, that, that fills in some of the colors here, but the president was using the power of the presidency, the power to grant or not grant a meeting with the president of Ukraine, which is a big freaking deal, because Ukraine is terrified of being overrun by Russia, so it depends enormously on the support of the United States. So granting a meeting with the president of Ukraine is a BFD. Using the power to grant a meeting or not, using, a, apparently, this is not proven, but, but there's circumstantial evidence, using a suspension of uh, the, sort of the carrot of US military aid, which again is crucial for a country that fears being overrun, that is being overrun in its eastern parts by Russia, um, to to bully the government of a, a foreign government into investigating uh, a, a, a likely rival in the 2020 election. Um, that, th those, are, those are clear facts because Donald Trump has admitted, in effect, those things. Uh, we have what is, in effect, a, tra a, a loose transcript of a phone call. So that's the point of departure. To me, that itself is an effort to undermine our, the, the, the integrity of our electoral process. You don't, it is, it is an impeachable offense, in my view, to seek the help of a foreign government in, in digging up dirt on your political rivals. You don't do that in a democracy. Yes? Great question. Why should Republicans be for, be, uh, become diverse? What incentive do Republicans have to become diverse? There's only, to, to, in my view, there's only one, uh, but it's a powerful one, and that is electoral, electoral defeat. Uh, if the Republican Party begins to get spanked repeatedly in elections, it will reform. Polit one thing we know about political parties is that parties change when they lose when the strategy that they're currently following does not result in victory, but results in repeated defeat, that's when they change. Um, so Republicans have to lose. If they, if they don't lose, if they're able to get by by cheating, um, as the Southern Democrats did for 80 flipping years in, uh, after Re Reconstruction, then, then, then there's no incentive. I don't think the Republicans can get away with anything even rem remotely like what the Southern Democrats did in the 19th century. So I think, I think the margin for cheating in the United States today is relatively narrow, and that, that, that the Republicans are going to pay the piper electorally pretty soon. I cannot tell you when, um, but it's, it's election defeat. It's when they lose. Sorry, I'm looking for, trying to look for gender balance. Yes? Yes. 
So the question is, can, can there ever be too much forbearance and should sometimes should, should, uh, uh, should either the president or Congress actually push more? Um, look, I, I'm never going to, you can never say never in these things. Um, the, the, the political rules of the game, the political norms, constitutional norms are always in flux. They're always changing. The president's role, the president's power today if you compare it to, say, the late 19th century, it's, it's night and day. You wouldn't recognize uh, American democracy from the perspective of 100 years ago. So these things are uh, the, the norms of, about presidential power and executive legislative relations are always evolving. Um, and it, it's also the case that there are some circumstances in, in which the position that I just took against Democrats fighting like Republicans could be could be the wrong strategy, right? At, at some at some point, if the uh, if the the folks in power are so dangerous um, that 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 democracy is going to be steamrolled if you don't fight back, then it's, at some point you got to fight back, right? There was a, there was a point in Germany in the early 1930s where forbearance was not a good idea. Um, so, so there's no way you could ever make a blanket statement that forbearance is always good. Um, but we are in a dangerous spiral of constitutional hardball today. Democracy, democratic institutions only function, especially in a presidential system, which is really complicated. Making a democracy work when one party controls the executive and another party controls Congress is really hard. I study Latin America. Most of the time, when one party controls the Congress and another party controls the presidency in Latin America over the last 50 years, you've gotten a constitutional crisis. It's really hard to do. It requires de effective norms. It requires restraint. So this, uh, the, it's th the idea that we're going to use every tool in the toolbox, we're going to win by any means necessary, that's the strategy that, that, that it's, it's predominant now in the Republican Party. It's creeping in the Democratic Party, too. Uh, as a general statement right now, I think it's getting us into trouble. Yes? Sure. So the question is whether uh, sort of different interpretations of how to go about pushing social mobility are, are causing polarization. Um, Republicans wanting to maintain more traditional, more pre-existing uh, ladders upward, and Democrats thinking about uh, ways of bringing pre historically excluded groups, giving them a shot at the ladder, for sure. Uh, in part because, again, the bottom 40% in this society has made no progress up that ladder over the last two generations. So the perception, whether it's right or wrong, the perception that other groups are getting, are getting uh, e either are uh, getting an advantage in getting up the ladder or are somehow making it up the ladder while I'm not is going to generate resentment. So um, you know, if, if we were dealing with becoming a diverse society, if we were integrating a massive wave of immigrants and uh, dealing with two centuries of, uh, of the legacies of slavery and discrimination at a time when inequality was low, at a time when incomes were rising for everybody, at a time when everybody was making up the ladder, it would be less polarizing. But we're not. We're doing it at a time um, where 40% where of the population feels stuck. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, yes. I'm sorry. Could you speak up a little bit? I'm getting old and I can't hear anything. Which which party would have a Oh, am I, am I, you mean 
do I think that a party or candidate who uses mutual toleration and forbearance would have a better chance or a worse chance? That's a great question, and I don't really know the answer. Um, they, there's a, and we're actually seeing this in the Democratic Party. So Joe Biden, I, I hate to brag, but Joe Biden really likes this book. <laughs> I, a, a friend of my co-author, Daniel, saw him on the train highlighting this, like yellow highlighting the book. And he's talked about this book on the campaign trail. So Biden is a, the reason he likes it is it feeds into his narrative of, you know, if we can just sort of get Trump out, we can go back to the good old days of mutual toleration and forbearance. So Biden is a big believer in that. There are others competing for the presidency in the Democratic Party who not so much. Here's what I think. I think that in, um, again, we have a primary system in which a relatively small number of uh, partisans on, in each party vote in the primaries. It's a small group. And it's people who tend to be really committed. And in a context of polarization, they tend to be people who are pretty into the polarization, um, who don't want to make concessions to the other side, who want to, in the Democratic side, who want to beat the crap out of Trump, and on the Republican side, who want, what's the word? They want to uh, do something to, to the libs. Um, so my fear is that in a context of polarization, the candidate who promises to fight hard and to not go around with, a, with a making nice and with a, with a hand tied behind her back is going to do well in primaries. And the candidate who says that she wants to make nice and, and use forbearance and believes in restraint and getting back to democratic norms is not going to do well in primaries. Might do well in a general election, but not in primaries. Primaries tend to reinforce polarization. So my guess is ultimately uh, more hardball-oriented candidates will often win. Yes? So you said that Trump is a symptom and not a cause of polarization. Yes. Uh, do you think Joe Biden was misguided in thinking that President Trump would bring back like forbearance and you know, those qualities? The question is, is, is yeah, I actually had a line about this in, my, in the talk, which I stripped out because I think I was talking for way too long. Uh, is Biden wrong in, in suggesting that, uh, just, that Trump is the problem and if we can just get rid of Trump, uh, all will be better? Um, yes, I think that Biden is wrong. Uh, it's very important. When you've got a, 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 an individual in the White House with authoritarian instincts, who looks at critics and sees traitors and wants to use the power of the state to investigate and punish them, it's very important to get them out of office. So what Biden is saying is not unimportant, but it won't solve our problems. We will, the day one of Biden's presidency, should he win, we will face the same problems of polarization, eroding norms, and constitutional hardball. Um, it, it is his, his presence in the removal of Trump and his presence, as many you know, years of, of, of friendship as he may have with Mitch McConnell, we are not going back, at least as things stand now, we are not going back to the 1970s and 80s. Not right away. Yes? Look, I think, so the question is, would impeachment sort of embarrass the United States on the international stage and erode its, its status as a poster child, an international poster child for democracy? Um, it might, but I would say a couple of things. First of all, unfortunately, the United States is not today much of a poster child for democracy. Uh, the, the folks who are imitating the United States today are, um, are autocrats in Honduras, Philippines, and elsewhere who use tr Trump's language. Uh, press is the enemies of the people. The deep state is after me. Um, and, and, and then point to Trump and say, well, the president of the United States said it. That must be legitimate discourse. So um, the United States is not today, unfortunately, 
a model of democracy. Um, whether our impeach, whether an impeachment and, and removal, if, if Trump were to be removed, would, would sort of worsen that image or begin to correct it and say, hey, wow, these guys have figured out how to peacefully and constitutionally get rid of a bad president. I, I don't really know, because I, I, I don't know enough about international opinion. But I think um, what I would say is where we are right now, pre-impeachment, is not good in terms of the US's image abroad. We are at, at probably the worst place we've been since World War II in terms of our image as a democracy. OK, sir. So <clears throat> given the dilemma that the Democrats find themselves in, of having exercised some forbearance in, uh, in regard to impeachment, but now finding themselves in a situation where they feel almost ethically bound to exercise their oversight in this area, um, how would you advise them in how to, how to walk this If, if I knew how to advise the Democratic Party, I would have a much, this is why I like being a professor. I can point to the problems and not to provide any solutions to anybody. So the question is, how, how would I advise the Democrats to go through this very thorny process of um, if, if they feel, or either they feel ethically bound or their base has pushed them, they're in a place where they really can't go back. They've got to go forward with impeachment. How do they do that without uh, doing more, more damage? Um, Again, I think thus far, they've actually, they deserve a lot of credit. They have, despite a lot of pressure from the base, to impeach Trump since day one. They, Pelosi, to, to, I think to her credit, and she's taken a lot of heat from the left wing of the Democratic Party, she's been incredibly restrained. So she's able, I think, to legitimately say, we've been cautious, deliberate, restrained. I think going forward, the, the key, which may be impossible, but the key is finding bipartisan support. The key is whether it's retired Republicans, because Republicans who have elections in their future, who want to maintain political careers, right now have a very hard time opposing Trump because 90% of Republicans support Trump. And so anybody, and the Republicans have learned that anybody who takes on Trump gets their political career ended. This is Jeff Flake, Bob Corker, uh, uh, blanking on the congressman from South Carolina. Sanford, Sanford Mark Sanford. Um, so it's, it's seen, uh, taking on Trump is viewed by Republicans legitimately as political suicide. So it's very, very hard. But Republicans, Democrats have to do it anyway. They have to find legitimate Republican figures to endorse impeachment, whether it's G.W. Bush, retired Republicans, uh, whether it's Mitt Romney, they have to build some legitimate bipartisan coalition behind it. If they do that, um, that will make this a much, much more legitimate process going forward. If this is ultimately seen as a partisan impeachment, it, even if it's necessary, even if it's the right thing to do, it will reinforce this descent into, into escalating constitutional hardball. Uh, yes. So earlier in, in your speech, you mentioned about how Republican, uh, Republicans attacked President Obama for saying, oh, he wasn't born in the United States, he was an African American, all these things. But in fact, you just said he was born in the United States. Would you, would it, wouldn't you agree that the Democratic Party, to some degree, has a Democratic Party uh, right now, and has essentially, in, at least either indirect way, promoted authoritarian? So the question is, aren't Democrats doing the same thing to Trump that Republicans did to Obama, um, and, and therefore sort of reinforcing this process? I would say partially, because there, it, it, in, a, in a process of polarization and escalating constitutional hardball, there are always two players. And it, 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 this is not, it, this, there's been an asymmetry in that I think the process began with Republicans and the greatest abuse has been committed by Republicans. But both sides have played this game. 
uh, you know, it was Harry Reid who ended the filibuster for, for federal uh, judiciary picks. So there's, it's not the case that one party is, uh, is Lily White and the other party uh, uh, the, the sinner in this. It, it, it's, it's escalation requires two. That said, there's a difference. I mean, all my uh, liberal friends say the, the worst possible things about Donald Trump, that he's a traitor, that he's a, you know, uh, the, the worst possible thing. The difference is you don't see many national Democratic Party leaders saying the kinds of things about Trump that national Republican leaders said about Obama when he was president. If you listen to, to Schumer and Pelosi, you don't get things like Donald Trump is not an American. Um, you, you don't get, you don't hear the word traitor being, being thrown around by Democratic Party leaders. Democratic Party activists, for sure. But I'm talking about party elites. And thus far, my view is that the Democratic Party leadership has been pretty restrained. Okay, I'm afraid our time is up. Let me remind you of two things. One is, um, uh, Professor Levitsky only talked a, about America today, but this book actually talks a lot about other countries as well and what's been going on there. I encourage you, if you want to learn more, to come tomorrow to a talk at noon at Foley Institute Down the Line. Uh, we'll be talking about Latin America and what's going to happen there in terms of talk about uh, uh, and, and now, um, let me uh, uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. And join me now in thanking Professor Levitsky for really interesting. Thank you.